Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel, or ARC. I'm Ed Baker, and I'm your host. I'm very pleased, as usual, to be with you here today. Today we have a distinguished uh, guest, Dr. Brandon Marshall. Dr. Marshall, thank Hi. you for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Ed. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yes. Uh, Dr. Marshall is a PhD, a professor of epidemiology at the Brown University School of Public Health. He's the founding director of the People, Place, and Health Collective at Brown University. Dr. Marshall focuses on substance use epidemiology with a specific emphasis on harm reduction research and overdose prevention. His team evaluates programs and policies that aim to improve the health and well-being of people who use drugs. He is the principal investigator of multiple National Institute of Health funded projects, including the Rhode Island Prescription and Injection Drug Use Study, or RAPIDS, and Provident, a randomized trial to prevent overdose death in Rhode Island. Brandon is also the scientific director of Prevent Overdose RI, Rhode Island's Drug Overdose Surveillance and Information Dashboard. He works closely with the Rhode Island Department of Health to track, measure, and evaluate efforts to address the state's opioid overdose epidemic. He also serves as an expert advisor to the Rhode Island Governor's Overdose Prevention and Intervention Task Force. <clears throat> Again, once again, Dr. Marshall, thank you so much for bringing your expertise to the show. <clears throat> oh, thank you for inviting me, Ed. I can't wait to get into the topic today. You know, I'd like to just give a little context. In Vermont, my home state, uh, where we're getting beat up, in 2021, we had 217 drug overdose deaths. 217. This number has quadrupled since 2010. In 2021, Vermont had the highest rate of overdose death in America. And this trend continues into 2022, and there's no reason to believe it is not going to continue into 2023. Yeah. Now, I'm going to read you a sentence from Governor Philip Scott's veto of H-728. H-728 was a bill, an act, relating to opioid overdose response services. This is his quote. From my standpoint, it seems counterintuitive to divert resources from proven harm reduction strategies to plan injection sites without clear data on the effectiveness of this approach. Close the quote. So I'd like to begin the show there, Dr. Uh, Marshall. <clears throat> Without clear data. Talk, let's talk about data. Let's talk about global data. Let's talk about data that you've studied on overdose prevention centers. What, what, are, the, what, what are the facts telling us? <clears throat> you know, these are interventions that have been highly studied in Europe, in Australia, in Canada for decades. You know, the first overdose prevention center opened in Vancouver um, in Canada in 2003. And like my supervisor used to say when I was fortunate to serve on the team that was evaluating that facility, this is one of the most highly studied public health interventions in the country. The research in other countries has been exhaustive. It's looked at both individual outcomes um, among people who use these facilities and their impacts on the communities in which they're located. So that statement is just untrue. When we look at the global data, we have a really good idea scientifically of what impact overdose prevention centers have on people who use them and on the communities in which they're located. I think I've, um, I've seen a paper that you authored citing the, uh, a statistic, I think it was a 35% reduction 
in overdose death surrounding the overdose prevention center, while uh, there was a 9% reduction overall in the same city. Is that, is that correct? Is that accurate? That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? 35, not to mention that millions of injections have happened over the course of these centers, and there's never been a death, not one death. Millions of injections, not one death. Plus, the surrounding areas show a reduction in death. That's right, Ed. You know, we had known that going into that research, that there had never and still hasn't been a death in any overdose prevention center anywhere in the world. But the goal of that work that you're describing was to understand the impact on community overdose fatality levels. And we worked very closely with the provincial coroner's office to understand exactly when and where overdose deaths were happening in the city of Vancouver, both before and after the facility opened in September 2003. And we carefully mapped those cases and found exactly what you described, a 35% reduction in overdose deaths in the immediate neighborhood in which InSight, the facility is located, compared to a 9% reduction in the city of Vancouver overall. We also accounted for other factors too that could change overdose uh, fatality rates, uh, things like underlying changes in drug use patterns in the community, uh, policing practices, and that effect really remained. And so it's pretty clear evidence, at least to me anyways, and a finding that's been corroborated in other countries mm -hmm. that these facilities, you know, not only save lives, but they actually reduce overdose death at a community level. Yes, you know, and uh, I mean, that's so encouraging and so refreshing, you know, in light of the in incredible uh, tragedy of what we face today in America. Mm -hmm. I, I think the People are saying 108,000, but I think the correct statistic is 107,622 Americans, people in America, lost to drug overdose in one year. We have fentanyl infiltrating the entire unregulated drug supply. Methamphetamine, mm -hmm. cocaine, uh, counterfeit Adderall, oxycodone, alprazolam, uh, heroin, if a person takes any one of those drugs today, they're at risk for death. We've never seen anything like this. So to me, as I look at it in my little state, and I see people dying, to me, it's what we're doing is tantamount to denying life-saving interventions to people at high risk for death. Is, is there any other way to to perceive America's reluctance to embrace overdose prevention centers? No, I think for any other public health problem that was associated with that much unnecessary pain and suffering, we would be doing everything possible to try to improve the public's health and to save lives. And only in situations where we, at the end of the day, have tremendous stigma right, this is something you've talked about on the show before, that I think prevents us from taking sensible steps from a public health perspective to address this problem. So that really is, I think you're right, the way to understand this problem and to understand why we continue to fail to make the changes needed in our approach uh, to actually you know, bring that number of uh, unprecedented lives lost down. You know, that, that's interesting that you mentioned stigma. The, the Addiction Recovery Channel was born out of a devotion to contribute to eliminating stigma. And, and we're in our sixth year now. We've been doing this for six years. We've had people from all levels of interventions, all walks of life, uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, medicine, state government, city government, treatment, recovery, people who use drugs, people in recovery, all contributing to diminishing stigma. John Kelly um, from the Recovery Research Institute, who wrote that paper, that famous paper in 2010, comparing person with a drug use disorder 
to drug abuser. That was the beginning of our countries, like focusing their attention on language, was on the show. And I asked him, I said, Dr. Kelly, do you think that stigma plays a role in America's reluctance to embrace overdose prevention centers? He said, of course. And his answer, yes. was, so, his answer was so simple. He says, stigma causes people to misinterpret data. They mm. misinterpret data. They mm. don't see the data. The data that you see, the data that I see, they misinterpret and say, oh, it doesn't work. The, 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 the research is flimsy. It'll never work in a rural state. It'll never work in a rural state that has a city with 43, 45,000 people in Burlington, 10 square miles. That's not the description of a rural state. It would work in Burlington. We have the mayor, the city council, the state's attorney, um, uh, all in favor of an overdose prevention site. But what we have blocking it is a governor and a health commissioner who are dug in, dug in and unwilling to even pass a bill that was designed to develop a study group. They won't even study it. So this is what we're up against. When I look at uh, states like Rhode Island, states like New York, and I'd like to go there now, because these are two shining examples in America w w that have embraced overdose prevention centers. So let's talk about your state first, Rhode Island. Sure. So we've been on a pretty incredible journey, I have to say, Ed, and this is something that I should say harm reduction and recovery advocates have been pushing for years. So this is not something that happened overnight in our state. This is something that the community, both the harm reduction and recovery community have been pushing for, have been asking for. And we were incredibly fortunate to have a governor listen and pass a bill last year that authorizes overdose prevention centers in our state. Mm -hmm. Now, there are you know, some challenges there. It is a pilot a program, the law sunsets after two years. So we have to get going to start to open these facilities. We can talk about that. Um, from a research side, that means we've got to hit the ground running and understand how they might work in Rhode Island, how we can improve their effectiveness, how we could do this better mm -hmm. than in other countries. That's something I want to talk about as well. And then something else we can talk about is that the bill does require that municipalities approve the siting of a location before the license from the health department is given. And so that's a potential barrier. Um, and we can talk about where we are right now in Rhode Island, um, working through that. But there is, you know, some layers, I think, that we're still working towards to end up with an actual open facility like in, in New York. Um, but I'm hopeful that we're we're getting there and we're tackling these challenges and barriers every day and that we will see an overdose prevention center open in the state in 2023. Well, you know, there seems to be two ro routes in America so far. There's the mm -hmm. outside the legislature route, which happened in New York with a lot of support but without legislation. Yeah. Then there's the legislative route, which is happening in Rhode Island. Now, yeah. I've kind of I paid a little bit of attention to your um, your task force on allocating opioid settlement funds. And let me tell you, when I saw that you had, your, and you're one of the experts on the committee, when I saw that, my heart was leaping with joy. And I want you to talk about that. It looks to me, and correct me if I'm a little bit off, but it looks to me like $2.5 million of opioid settlement funds have been earmarked for overdose prevention centers. Is that true? 2.25. 2.25. Uh, and that's this fiscal year. So that represents, uh, you know, a year's worth of funding. And my hope is that support for overdose prevention centers will continue in future settlement allocations. It's a 17 or 18 year settlement. So this is really a tremendous and new source of funding to address the overdose crisis. And I'm so happy to see that our committee in the state that's overseeing this funding really has identified overdose prevention centers as a critical part of the puzzle to address the problem. 
and to support them financially. And as far as I'm aware, this is the first jurisdiction in the U.S. that is going to be financially supporting overdose prevention centers as a strategy. Um, and so that is happening right now. The funding should be made available very shortly and organizations that wish to apply to open a harm reduction center, what we're calling an, an overdose prevention center, um, will be able to um, apply for that funding very shortly. This is incredible news. This is incredible news for my viewers in Vermont yeah. and my viewers elsewhere because people have been reluctant to begin to believe that what you've done is possible. The argument is, oh, the Department of Justice, you know, the safe house uh, litigation is not resolved. Therefore, we can't earmark any of this money for an overdose prevention center. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't seem to be the case. Rhode Island went ahead anyway. Do you care to talk about that process or what the thinking was that went into that, I think people could learn from that. Sure, yeah, and I have to say, because the meetings are public, I can I can talk about the process. Mm -hmm. There was little, I should say, no opposition, Ed, that we heard as a committee, um, and very little opposition that I'm aware of once the decision was made public and um, described in the media. So I think, you know, a lot of the concern about, at this point, the quote unquote controversial nature of these interventions is just not bearing out. I think so many Rhode Islanders have been personally affected by the overdose crisis. Mm -hmm. They know friends, they know family members, they know colleagues who have died of an overdose or who know people who have lost loved ones to overdose. And I think we're seeing a sea change now where the public imagines, can imagine what this intervention looks like and what it aims to do, which is to save lives and help people access resources and treatment. So I think we've been effective in Rhode Island at getting that message out there at explaining what these programs do. And I believe the opposition is, is you know, diminishing greatly and in some cases not there um, at all. We can talk more about more localized neighborhood dynamics. That is something that still um, keeps me up at night, honestly, the mm -hmm. degree mm -hmm. of NIMBYism that we may experience as yeah. organizations aim to yeah. actually open a facility. But at a state level, and in terms of actually dedicating resources to get these facilities open, the opposition has just you know, not been there. And I, I think that's in part due to the the pervasiveness of the crisis and how many people have been infected and then the amazing work that advocates have done in, on the ground here for many years okay. to um, educate the public and to explain that this is an evidence-based public health approach. That's just um, remarkable. I'd like to just mention also that one of the things I noticed about the panel itself or the committee itself was that there was a segment where I think there were it was called experts, and I think there were four or five noted experts on the panel. Is that true? On the Settlement Advisory Committee? Yes. That's, yes, that's correct. Yes, there are city and town representatives, representatives from the health department and some other civil society, and then uh, expert advisors, including people with lived experience as well. See, I, as I, when I looked at that and saw that, I thought, the, the, the committee was designed in a way that guaranteed like objective data to be introduced into the deliberations. And that to me was very refreshing, that it wasn't going mm -hmm. to be dominated by special interests, that there was going to be actual expert uh, input. Did you have a, a part in that? I did. You know, mm -hmm. I've been very happy in any venue or with any group to talk about what the science has shown around overdose prevention centers. Um, so I've been, you know, playing my role in educating um, lawmakers here in the state, other interested groups, law enforcement, really anyone who's willing to hear what the science has show, I'm happy to speak with. So um, that has been happening. And, and I think a similar process happened in these committee deliberations. 
I should say the other framework that our state is using as well is that right, you know, we have 17 years worth of funding through these opioid settlements. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have just a tremendous crisis of overdose, preventable overdose death. And so we are, you know, focusing our funding on interventions that save lives. You know, that's where we feel we need to do the most amount of work right now. And so that is reflected in the large degree of harm reduction funding that's going through the settlement over the next few years. Our hope yeah. is that over time, we'll be able to focus more on the social determinants of health, the treatment system in the state, the housing crisis that's going on. All of these things we know play a role in perpetuating the overdose crisis. The goal is to over time, shift funding to address some of those underlying drivers of the overdose crisis. But mm -hmm. the thinking, the framework is that right now we have an unprecedented number of Rhode Islanders dying for preventable drug overdose every year. We, we need to do something about it. And one of the most immediate ways to address that specific problem is through harm reduction interventions like overdose prevention centers. You know, I mean, it, it makes such uh perfect sense that to even think that we could think differently is, is, is difficult to understand how that couldn't be so obvious to people. I think that the two words, and, and it's not obvious to people, or it gets confused and you know, covered up by stigma. The, the two words I think that the, the opioid settlement um, uses Two words that stick out to me were, were efficacy and immediacy. Mm -hmm. and, and it sounds like mm -hmm. you've grasped both of those perfectly. Efficacy and immediacy in saving lives. There's nothing that works better for this most at-risk population than an overdose prevention center. What is your view? A friend recently sent me a paper. It studied uh, drug overdose death from 2010 to 2018. And it cited that drug overdose death as a result of injection had increased eightfold in 10 years. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that your impression that most, and, uh, that most of the deaths we're seeing are by injection drug use? The last time I looked at the data in Rhode Island, I would say about 35-40% of the overdose deaths had some evidence of injection drug use. So mm -hmm. I would not say the majority, and that was several years ago. Um, you know, and what we've seen, I think, in Rhode Island and in other states is a shift to inhalation of substances like mm -hmm. uh, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, uh, and so that carries with it, you know, specific types of challenges and risks. Mm -hmm. As relates to overdose prevention centers, um, this issue came up in the state committee that was tasked with developing the regulatory framework for overdose prevention centers. And those regulations will actually require operators of an OPC to offer services for people who inject and smoke their drugs. So that looks like you know, a vented room or some other way to mm -hmm. safely allow people to mm -hmm. smoke. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was, that was, is important, I think, for two reasons. You know, you want these interventions to be as accessible as possible to the broadest population of people at risk for overdose. And we know people who smoke drugs are at risk for overdose. Mm -hmm. And then it was also seen as a racial justice issue. We know from our data that people who smoke or inhale substances are more likely to be people of color, at least in our state. And so if services aren't providing options for that population in particular, we're only perpetuating some of the inequities in access to harm reduction and treatment services that we've seen in the past. And so, you know, that was something that I learned a lot about watching that process unfold here in the state and really nailed in for me the importance of providing the broadest array of services at an overdose prevention center so that it's accessible and useful to the diverse populations of people who use drugs in our state and in other settings as well. Yes, it was from, from the reading in the, uh, that I'm doing and the people I'm speaking with, 
uh, I'm under the impression that the more an overdose prevention site becomes integrated into the system, the more likely it is to marginalize certain populations and that mm. we need input mm. from people who use drugs in policy planning. And um, it seems to me that that's what you had in uh, Rhode Island. It's the um, nothing about us without us. Did you, did you embrace that? That is what we hope to embrace, honestly, Ed. You know, we could do much better, I think. Um, we have a very strong recovery community in Rhode Island and wonderful recovery advocates, people in leadership roles who are driving a lot of these conversations around harm reduction. Mm -hmm. What we do not have, honestly, are the voices of people who are actively using at the table. And so I think that's something that we need to do a lot better um, as we start to develop and implement these services. You know, something I've learned uh, from OnPoint in New York City, they have two sites, I'm sure, as you know, mm -hmm. and the sites are designed slightly differently to mm -hmm. meet the needs of distinct populations. You know, some, um, one is more medicalized and one is more peer driven. And I, I've enjoyed learning about why they decided to have two different models mm -hmm. and how they're acceptable in different ways. So uh, there are sort of more and less medicalized models of overdose prevention centers. One is not necessarily better or worse, but you do need to make sure that whatever service you provide, medicalized or peer-based or what have you, that it, it, it is what people who use the facility want. And you only learn that by talking to people who are actively using or who would use the service. Yeah. So that's something that we have to continue to do here and you know, in other jurisdictions as we see OPCs get implemented. Yeah, I think, that, I think the site in Washington Heights is peer-driven and the site in, in uh, Harlem is um, more, more of a, a medicalized model. But I mean, what, what you're saying is, is so in Rhode Island, anyway, you need to engage people who use drugs in policy formation a little bit more going forward. That's a goal you'll have. And, and from, from where I sit and what I see, an overdose prevention center and engaging people and showing them that they're safe and that they can trust you and they can come and not be judged and not fear being punished is the perfect way to begin to engage them in relationships that would lead into including them in policy development. I mean, it, it, you just can't do it. It has to be a process. But it yeah. seems like you've got the perfect pieces in place uh, to do that eventually. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. And that is so critical to OPC, to overdose prevention centers, is to build that rapport and that res and to respect people's autonomy, and and then through the building of relationships, you know, then that's where the engagement with other services might start. That's where you're right. We might have that trust in place for people who use drugs to to then you know, take leadership roles, ideally, in the yeah. expansion or the design of yeah. other yeah. services. So yeah. I'm hoping that what you're saying is true, that as we implement overdose prevention centers, we will see more of that um, voice and active engagement of people who use drugs in the in the expansion of these services. So let's let's hope we get there. Let's hope we get there. Beautiful. You know, it's, it's wonderful thinking that you have like 18 years of funds uh, coming in that that that, that yeah. you can use and um, yeah you know you know yeah. you know you're familiar with Kaylin C from New York you mm -hmm. know Kaylin yes we're both Canadians so we've, uh, <laughs> we've talked a little bit about that and, uh, <laughs> thank you Canada no, I, you for Kaylin and Brandon thank you <laughs> <laughs> she was on the show and um, she talked with such love about the people who utilize uh, on point it was just beautiful. And to hear that, you know, people, people come in to use drugs in a, a safe environment where they're cared for, where they're comfortable, where they don't have to hurry, 
where they don't have to worry about being arrested or being attacked, where they, they feel a sense of like being at home. Uh, they, they have a barber, they have a laundry, they have all kinds of uh, other services for people. She told me they never uh, discharge anyone without discharging them to another service. It isn't just come in, utilize the service and leave. There's always activity mm -hmm. going on that's geared toward engaging the person. How are you doing with housing? How are you doing with your court case? How are your kids? Do you have enough food for your dog? You know, what's going on with you? They get to know people. And, and people who use drugs, the way these people use drugs, that is the most refreshing interaction that they can ever have. They're so um, denied that kind of, of interaction that, that they, it seems that once they begin to engage in that, that's one of the reasons they come back to the center is for that. And that, that to me is just um, uh, beautiful. I talked to um, Ann Livingston, who was one of the uh, co-founders of Vandu, about her efforts uh, with, with people who use drugs back when, when they organized to advocate for Vandu. And she said that she invited them um, over to her house. And what she did was she asked them, what can, we, what can we do for you? What do you need? And she said, invariably, in every, every group she starts, and that's what she does, that's all she does is organize people who use drugs. She said, what they do is they'll weep at that. They're so touched by someone actually looking at them and caring about them from the heart that it makes them weep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because so many other systems that are designed to help, like the medical system, at the end of the day, we see often as much or if not more stigma, right? right. And so even in the places where we think we should be able to turn to for help for health care, uh, unfortunately, that is just not the case. They're punitive, they're stigmatizing, you know, and so a lot of people have had such negative experiences with the existing medical and social service system that this can be one of the first places in a long time anywhere is where people go and they feel respected, they feel listened to, and they feel like their needs are met. So it's a very special environment in that way. You know, and again, sort of speaks to the in, just unbelievable stigma that operates not just generally in society, yeah. but in the medical and social service systems as well. Um, and, and so that's, I think, even more so why OPCs are, are just so important and so special and so effective at, um, at addressing some of, these, some of these health issues. You know, and Nora, Nora Volkov, um speaks eloquently to that in a number of her papers, how there is stigma in the healthcare profession, there is mm -hmm. stigma in the service professions, the professions that are dedicated to uh, dealing with um, people, people with addiction. She's not afraid to, to call, call that out. You know, I think we mentioned John Kelly a little earlier in language. I think in, in America, in, in, in over the past seven or eight years, we have come light years in, in being aware of stigma mm -hmm. and changing our language. Mm -hmm. uh, the Office of Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs in Vermont, Vermont is now the Office of uh, Drug Use Services. Yeah. Uh, Nora yeah. Volkov, uh, she was on the show, told me that NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, the name was changing to the National Institute on Drugs and Addiction. So yeah. even yeah. even the um, bureaucratic political wheels have you know done what they've need, needed to do to change some of the the big stigmatizing language. But in the field, if someone says addict, you know people kind of look at them now like, what are you? How come you're not saying person with drug mm -hmm. use disorder? It's become the norm. We've come a long way with language. But mm -hmm. I, I think what's happening is there's a danger in that. The mm -hmm. danger in that is that we think because we've changed our language that we've eradicated stigma, when stigma has deep, deep roots. And you can use yeah. all the proper language, but still be driven, sometimes implicitly or unconsciously, by stigma. And I, I yeah. do believe 
that where that's most evident is when you have people with power and people with money refusing to allocate money toward mm. science-proven interventions like mm. overdose prevention centers. It's like the acid test for stigma. You can mm -hmm. use all the right language, but why aren't you using the funds? Find the funds, follow the science. It's just not happening. It's happening in Rhode Island, and it's happening in New York. <clears throat> yeah. You know, and I think what else I've seen too, Ed, is the interaction of, and they, they feed off each other, stigma, and then incredibly harmful misperceptions about how drug use works, and they're so closely tied to each other, you know, so one of the most harmful misconceptions I continue to hear, and this gets to your point where like using better language is good, but we also need to address these misconceptions too, is this idea that people will only want to engage in treatment or recovery services once they quote unquote hit rock bottom, oh. and that these kinds of services like OPCs are therefore not effective because they prevent someone from doing that. So let's just like disentangle this harmful stereotype for a moment. Mm -hmm. First of all, nowadays, even if that was true, hitting rock bottom is deadly for many people, right? So at just at face value, that is a deadly strategy um, at this point, mm -hmm. given the toxicity of the unregulated drug supply. And in fact, we know that it's just not true right? That it is not an effective way to engage someone. It's incredibly harmful. The opposite is actually true. You need to build a network of trust and love and support around people. And that is the way to more effectively engage rather than pushing people away and feeling like that will be more effective at the eventual outcome. And so I think like how to address the societal misconceptions of how addiction works. I don't have the answer to that, but I see it being incredibly harmful as vis-a-vis, um, -vis, you know, reasons for not implementing things like OPCs. Does that make sense? It makes, it makes <laughs> perfect sense. It made me gasp when you brought it up because it makes this perfect sense. It's so absolutely important. We think in America that the way a person finds their way out of problematic or very harmful drug use is through discomfort. We'll let them right. get as uncomfortable as they can. We'll arrest them, put them in jail. We'll stigmatize them, yeah. prosecute them, persecute them. We'll make them so uncomfortable that they'll stop taking drugs, which couldn't be further from the truth. All those kinds of behaviors cause a person to feel so discouraged that there's nowhere to turn, which is an incentive to keep taking drugs. Exactly. exactly. When 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 um, hitting bottom. When you said that, I mean, it just is just so archaic to even yeah. think yeah. that. First of yeah. all, like you alluded to, with fentanyl, you will die long before you hit bottom. There's no time mm -hmm. anymore to hit this so-called bottom. I yeah. thought about it the other day, and and. Um, what came to me is people do not need to hit bottom. People need to hit safety. Mm. That's what they need to hit, safety. Mm. When a person who's having a life characterized by the symptoms associated with, with, with drug use hits an environment or is exposed to an environment that's safe, where people look at them and care about them, like Ann Livingston, what do you need? How can I help you? Not like, you know, you have to go into treatment for 180 days. No, no, no demands, no, no yeah. unrealistic expectations, no judgment, no stigma, concern, and you said it, love. What can we do yeah. for you? How can we help you? When a person hits that, and it has to be congruent, it can't be just words. It has to be congruent with the way the person is inside. I want mm -hmm. to help you. I'm not just calling you a person with substance use disorder because it's politically correct. I, I, I believe you have worth. I believe you have dignity. I'm here for you. When a person hits that and feels that safety, they're engaged. They're engaged. 
and then we can help them do, you know, the the a long harm reduction philosophy. What whatever positive thing they want to do, they're engaged in it. This is what I want to do. I want to get a place to live. I want to get a haircut. I want to get more food for my dog. I want to go back to school. I want buprenorphine. You know, whatever. We can help them do whatever they want to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the magic of overdose prevention centers. So I'm glad we I'm glad we hit on this, Ed, because it's so critical to understanding, I think, what they're doing and how they do it so well. Talk about that. Talk about the magic because the magic to me, the magic of overdose prevention centers is the magic of harm reduction. Can you mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that? What is that, the essence of harm reduction, as opposed to abstinence-based treatment or, you know, it is, as opposed to all other types of interventions, what's the essence of harm reduction? Mm-hmm. You know, we often use the term meeting people where they're at, right? But I think it's deeper than that. It's, it's about uh, truly listening and understanding someone's both immediate needs, you know, you're using and we want to protect you from overdose. That's an immediate need that we can address through public health tools. But then, as you said, what are your longer term goals? You know, do you want housing? Do you want um, employment options? You know, do you need to find a different place, someone else to be with, some um other situation that we can mm-hmm. help you get to so it's through that true listening i think where a lot of the essence of harm reduction actually comes from so it's yes like meeting people where you're at but core to that is actually empathetic listening and then being able to have the tools to to make those changes and that and that's where you actually need resources going back to our earlier point yeah. right you, yeah. you you then need financial <laughs> support and resources to then enact those changes. And, and that's where we need policymakers, lawmakers to step up and actually, you know, fund these kinds of services at a real level. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, it's, and it's listening over time, mm-hmm. you know, not just once I'm listening to you, but every time you come in, I'm listening to you and I'm getting to know you. And I'm giving you the time. I'm setting aside time to be with you. And I'm having eye contact with you. And my body language tells you I care enough about you to be here with you. Tell me about yourself. Because we're talking about a population <clears throat> that has you know, suffered uh, discrimination, um, disenfranchisement, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. stigma, uh, prosecution, incarceration you know, for, for, for decades. Yeah. We're children of the war on drugs. I'm not. I mean, I was born before it. But from the war on drugs, it goes be, be, back before that in history. But since the 70s and the war on drugs, and this is why I have nothing but, but sympathy and compassion for people with stigma, because we've been inundated with stigmatizing information since birth. It's been coming at us through the media, through TV, through movies, through spoken language, through belief systems. We're taught it. We're all taught it. So people with substance use disorder, they've been victimized by an entire culture. And overcoming that and trusting is no mean feat. No mean feat. We have to listen to them continuously over and over again. And, you know, that's where I think science can play a role, right, is that we aim to collect the data to understand the impacts of these kinds of programs, in large part to push back against these harmful, untrue misconceptions of how, in this case, harmful or problematic drug use works, right? So that's Really, at the end of the day, why I love what I do is because the studies that we do, you know, yes, are sort of showing impacts on health outcomes, and that's very interesting. But at the end of the day, time and time again, when we do harm reduction research, we see that the findings help push back against those harmful 
uh, misconceptions and misperceptions of how um, drug use works in our society. So, you know, that's kind of what keeps me going at the end of the day. Even if we don't always get wins and we face, you know it, lots and lots of pushbacks, it keeps me going because I'm hopeful that if I keep doing what I'm doing and that if you keep doing what you're doing and that if we keep spreading the message and that includes scientific evidence that we will get to a better place um, with harm reduction in the U.S. So that's <laughs> that's uh, the framework that I operate from, at least on a daily level. Yeah, you know, I mean, I am I am uh, very, very hopeful. I, I you know, I, I, I'm a person w I'm in recovery myself for a very long time. I, I injected drugs uh, for years. I was houseless uh, for years. I've been incarcerated. Uh, I, you know, I've been beat up by the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And somehow I made it. And um, it, from my own personal experience, the beginning of my making it was being exposed to a group of people who there was no stigma in the room. Mm -hmm. In fact, in fact, they valued me because I was a person with addiction. Mm -hmm. That was, I mean, to talk about a healing mm -hmm. salve, that mm -hmm. was something that really, um, really got my attention. And um, my life has been different uh, ever since. Now, with a lot, of, it's been a lot of work, but it's been different ever since. So I am, I'm a, I have an unrelenting hope and an unrelenting determination because of people like you, people who are out there like really um, on the tip of the spear, doing the hard research and taking the hard stand and organizing people, and and involved politically. It's just really, um, you know, a, a, a great thing to be to be a part of. Now, before we close, I'd just like to, um, I'd like to just say one more thing about Kaylin C. down in uh, New York City there. I'm a trained social worker. I'm a master's level social worker. And when I learned about social work and doing counseling and therapy and all that, we were taught that, you know, if somebody's under the influence of drugs, you know, you, you really shouldn't, you know, even go there. There's, there's not, mm -hmm. they're not going to remember anything. You know, just uh, you, you, you can't counsel someone like that. Kaylin C. and On Point, they're, they're, they're turning that around. Mm -hmm. They have a, a team of social workers on board that sit with people before, during, and after injecting or smoking drugs <clears throat> and counsel them and engage them in counseling relationships. This, to me, is to really think outside the box. Yeah. To really break through that stereotype, I can engage this person, I can interact with this person, this person will remember me, maybe this person will be motivated to trust me, and have counselors in there attempting that. This, to me, is so, so encouraging, just way, way outside the box. <clears throat> yeah, and you know, especially because so many of our existing interventions try to reach people when they're feeling amongst their worst, right? Like we've spent a lot of time trying to design emergency department based overdose prevention interventions. Mm -hmm. And it's challenging mm -hmm. because by definition, people coming into the emergency department don't feel well. They might be coming out of an overdose. They might've had naloxone administered. Yeah. They might be in drawl. And so it's like, I, I'm so appreciative of people who work in the ED and are are making those efforts to engage, but it's so tough because people don't feel well in those moments. You know, likewise in prison systems, it's like we focused a lot on building up our treatment system in the in the jail and prison system, which is which is good. But it's like you wonder, you know, could we do this better? And in fact, I think overdose prevention centers give us that little nugget of an answer, right? That like. When is it most effective to connect with someone, to reach someone, to talk about other services that they might be interested in? Perhaps the most effective time to do that uh, is actually post-consumption. 
And so I, I'm looking forward to learning more from Kaylin and others at on point and as we implement OPCs here about exactly that. You know, when how how do they how do they think about these conversations, social work practice, and and what does that mean when we have that very rather unique moment in the context of an OPC, which is engaging with someone post consumption. Yes. So um, there, I think there's a lot there Ed, to yeah. to learn more about, and I'm so glad people like Kaylin are are innovating and pushing the envelope on that. Certainly in the U.S., if not globally. So so beautiful, so beautiful. Now. I, it's my understanding that you're not only um, conducting research in Rhode Island, but you're also, are you affiliated with the On Point in New York City? Will you be doing research there along with NYU or what, what's going yeah. on with that? So we are, we are planning to partner. And the reason why we would like to do a what we call multi-site evaluation so a coordinated evaluation between opcs in new york city and rhode island is because they're going to look very different uh providence is a very small city compared to new york city probably the volume of people using the sites will be much smaller mm -hmm. the services are going to be different the design of the opcs will be different oh. so we thought there was a lot of value in partnering to understand like how these sites are going to look different and how they might mm -hmm. operate distinctly and vary, you know, in their effectiveness yeah. um, in these two contexts. So that's the idea. Yeah. We currently yeah. have a grant under review at the National Institutes of Health. So hopefully that is successful and we'll be able to start a, a full, a, you know, fully funded federal um, government funded evaluation in 2023. So. Yeah. Keep your fingers crossed that um, that is funded, and mm -hmm. I'd love to come back over the next few years and chat with you about what we learn in in both New York City and in Rhode Island. I would love I would love to have you back, and um, to me that's uh, is so encouraging because you know scaling this kind of program or fitting this kind of program into different environments, you know, is is paramount. You can't just have them in gigantic cities with dense populations. They have to yeah. be scalable to other environments. I'm yeah. very interested in that. My city, Burlington, we have 45,000 people. We had 51 deaths in one year. Yeah. We have um, a heat map of uh, overdose death in Burlington, which shows a, an extremely high concentration right in the city. And if you overlay that heat map onto public transportation with a central location, it makes it very easy to get to an overdose prevention site. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're looking at kind of scaling this to, you know, a, you know, a small city. Um, yeah. But resistance yeah. to that idea always comes with, oh, it's never been done in a small city. So research like yours will, will help us, will guide us. Now, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, uh, for being on the show. Brandon, for being on the show. I wanted to um, I wanted to end the show. Um, you know, I'd like to give you the opportunity, two opportunities actually. One, to speak to people who are at risk for death. What what do you want to say to them? And the other, to speak to advocates who are advocating for overdose prevention sites. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Ed, for the opportunity to do this. To people who use drugs or who might be at risk for overdose, you know, what I would like to say is that I know that a lot of the research that we have, we do, we have done, is honestly not, you know, not great. As I said earlier, we need to be more thoughtful about how we actively listen to people who use drugs and truly engage them in our research to make it stronger and better. So that's my commitment for this forthcoming evaluation is to work on that, you know what I mean? And make that more effective so that this evaluation is something that we can all be proud of and really stand behind. So, you know, for anyone out there in Rhode Island or elsewhere, please reach out to me and, and and I'd love to chat about partnering on how to actually do more truly engaged, community engaged research more effectively. And then to advocates, I would say the same thing. Please reach out to me. I'm happy, very happy to chat about 
the research that we've done, the research that's been done in other countries, because I've, I've seen the benefits, you know, the, talking about the scientific evidence isn't everything. It's not going to convince everyone. I found that personal stories are incredibly powerful stories like your Ed, yours Ed, this conversation we're having, connecting with people one-on-one -on -one is incredibly powerful for changing uh, minds. But I, I believe that scientific evidence plays a role in this discussion and can help get people there to understand the merits of these types of interventions. So I'm happy to be part of that discussion uh, here in Rhode Island, elsewhere, um, you know, anywhere we might be thinking about or trying to open overdose prevention centers, reach out and I'm, I'm really happy to do what I can to help in that goal. You know, thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you so much. And um, I can, uh, we can add a slide to the show with your contact information. Uh, Great, your, your please email. do that. And um, I'll, I will be in touch with you, you know, in the future to, to, to follow your work. Um, we, I can speak for the, you know, community here in Vermont and, and probably everyone, in, you know, in America, all the people who are in the field, we're, we're so indebted to science, so indebted to science for, for focusing your resources on this, on this most pressing problem. So, so thank you, thank you very much. Thanks so much for all that you do, Ed. It's been such a delight and a pleasure chatting with you today. I've really enjoyed it.